Production funding for this program is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. It's a rare opportunity to be swimming with the sharks, you could say. So we have a shark, one of the original sharks on Shark Tank, inventor of the infomercial, pioneer for As Seen on TV, a wonderful opportunity to have a conversation with Kevin Harrington. So let's start because your father, you talk a lot about having a mentor yes. and your first mentor was your father. Yeah. Talk about your childhood and having a, a father that's a great mentor, but a great entrepreneur as well. I had a, a, a very uh, close family. I'm one of six kids and I was number four. So as my father had his restaurants and his businesses and things along the way, um, as, as they got down to me, the, the money started running a little short, okay? Because um, the family's kind of a little upset with my oldest sister because she went to a nice private school. By the time, you know, the, the fourth and the fifth and the sixth got there, we, were, we had to make our own uh, money to pay for our own schooling because not that my father wasn't successful, but uh, it's, it's an expensive uh, proposition raising six kids, you know? with schooling and education, the, the cars and all the things that you got to finance uh, along the way. So so very early on, he was like, well, look, you, you got to go out and make money. You know, you got to pay for these things. Right. And and so um, I worked in his restaurants when I was 11 and I was a bus boy, a dishwasher. And I, and I say, how do how do you become an assistant chef at the age of 11? Well, when your father owns the restaurant and the chef doesn't show, you're helping <laughs> your it. father cook the steaks, right? <laughs> so I was the assistant of my father, right? But no, he um, he was always would tell me, I'll never forget one of the first days that I worked for him. The beer truck delivery guy was bringing kegs of beer in, and he's like, count the kegs, I'm going to be running around. And it, it, he brought two in, then four, then six, and he'd take two empties back, two, two in, two out, empties back. So my father came walking through, and he's like, hey, beer truck guy, what are you doing there? And he's like, you're, you're, he says, I'm taking two empties back to the truck. Well, one was empty, one was full. And my father saw that the bottom one was sweating, it was cold, and it was still had beer in it. So he'd bring two full ones in, one full one and one empty back to the truck. So he's like, see, son, this man was stealing from us. He got fired on the spot. So I was learning all of these things as an owner. I'm 11 years old, but this, he caught this chef stealing steaks one night, and the busboy was stealing steak knives, and the beer guy stealing beer. So it's like, wow. I said, you know what? I don't want to own a restaurant. Okay, so uh, but, <laughs> but attention to detail and yeah. hard work. I mean, all of these things at 11 years old. Yeah, extremely rare to be learning. So I, I started my first business when I was 15. I was sealing driveways. Um, I grew up in, in Ohio, Cincinnati, not far here from Memphis. So. Um, it got cold in the winter, and if you had cracks in your driveway, the water would get in there, and it would, when it froze, it expanded those cracks. So I was sealing driveways, and I was doing um, anywhere from eight to ten driveways a week in the summer months. So then I said, well, let's see, it, this is only a summer business. What can I do year-round? thought, hmm, it gets cool hot heating and air conditioning, right? So I started a heating and air conditioning company and I was installing furnaces and air conditioning systems when I was in college. So um, it, it, I just had that entrepreneurial spirit. It was great having a father that motivated me and pushed me to be an entrepreneur. Well, even going to the heating and air conditioning, the way you went about your business model was very unique, where you would call a new homeowner and you would say, hey, congratulations, for free, we want to come out. And so talk a little bit just kind of your mantra. It's, it's really interesting just in terms of the customer service, but but the direct connect, the yes. relationship. So, so I always believed you you just don't open the doors of your business and wait for you know people to come and say build it and they will come. No, you have to build it and then market it and they will come. Okay, so um, when I was doing driveway ceiling, I was knocking on doors. When I started heating and air conditioning, this was brilliant um, um, advice I got from uh, my father. Go get all the new homeowners that just bought a house. And there's a public record of that in Cincinnati and maybe here in Memphis also. But I got this list, every new homeowner, and it was a public record. And so we'd, we'd get their phone number through cross-checking and whatever. We'd call them and congratulate them on the purchase of the new home. 
and say as a welcome gift to the neighborhood, please don't fire up that furnace until you get a safety check. And, you know, it's a dangerous, you know, uh, carbon monoxide and all that kind of stuff, right? So most of them, oh, this is amazing, You're a free safety check. We'd send out our technician and we'd clean the furnace free of charge, check for safety, check for connections and clean it all free of charge. But right then and there, we also had an opportunity to offer them something, a humidifier, electrostatic air cleaner, maybe a, a new, more efficient furnace. And by the way, very few of them had central air conditioning. They just bought a new house and they're gonna be sweating through. It got, gets very hot in Cincinnati, Ohio in the summer, right? So all of a sudden I got a business, I'm going to college every day, I'm installing 10 systems a week and we were off to the races first year, a million, second year, two million in sales. So it was an amazing business. And all this I mean, in college, while you're a college student too. So yes. burning the candle at all ends. And then what really led to the next chapter is you go to sell that business yes. and you see, wait a second, you're looking at all of these opportunities kind of laid out. Talk about launching the next phase. So I realized the heating and air conditioning business was very um, labor intensive. I was a good salesman. But we couldn't get good installers to be honest. I mean, I just, to install 10 systems a week required a, a team. We, we had six trucks, six crews, but I'd say, to be honest with you, three good crews and three, you know, halfway good crews, right? And so we were getting a lot of service problems and installation issues. And I just said, you know what, I, I don't like this. And I couldn't, I, there was no tech schools for these people. And I'd run an ad for a service man and get zero phone calls, right? So there was no monster or anything. This is back in the 70s. So um, I said, I got, I'm, I'm out. I'm, I just, you know, I, I can't deal with all this. And I, I installed systems for friends and, and they would have issues. And, I, you know, I just, I wasn't proud of, of, of my business. So uh, I'm sitting at the close at, 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 at a, a business brokerage company that was going to sell my business. And they, he had stacks of businesses for sale. And I was like, this is, you've got laundromats, pizza parlors, delicatessens, flower shops, uh, all these different companies for sale. And I'm going through them one by one. I'm looking at the percentages of food costs in the restaurants and the, the rent percentages, the lease agreements with the malls. And I'm like, wow, this is like, this is like a kid in a candy store full of entrepreneurship, right? And so I said, I'm going to sell my company and this is what I want to do. And so I, I did. And funny thing was, I got back from that meeting and one of my employees said, I heard you're interested in selling your company, I'm going to buy it. And it was the simple, I didn't have to pay a commission or anything. So I then became a business broker. I got a license and got the real estate test and all that for the state. So we were a real estate broker, real estate uh, licensed office, and we sold the business also. So um, we started getting listings and all of a sudden I had 200 listings. I had 14 employees and we said, these, I'd be sitting at the closing table, just like this, just let's sign here. You now own that restaurant. And I'd say, now, where are you going to get your insurance? And where are you going to, you know, oh, insurance. Yeah, I do need insurance for that restaurant, don't I? Well, what about your bookkeeping? What about, you, you need a new menu design, don't you? Well, I'm giving them the name of a graphic artist, an insurance company, a bookkeeper, all of this. And I'm like, wait a minute, I'm not getting paid for any of that. Why don't I bring it all, all under one roof? So. <laughs> I said, I rented a whole floor of an office building in downtown Cincinnati, and I leased an office to a lawyer, to an insurance agent, to a graphic guy, an advertising agency, et cetera, and we, did, we were the small business center, a one-stop center for small businesses. We sold you the business. We incorporated you. We did your books and records. We did your, you know, whatever you needed. You didn't have to, you know, by the way, if you had everything already, you didn't need us at all. But very few people didn't want something. So this then gave, in fact, what would happen a year later, they want to sell the business again because they didn't like it, you know, or the, maybe the husband bought it for the wife and she got tired of having to work 60 hours a week. Being an entrepreneur is not so easy. So, you know, we had a, a really um, good time for me, I would start, I started to invest in some of these businesses, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I'd sell something and I'd say, well, this is pretty cool. And we were doing franchises also. So I would, I would get franchise rights. I would get this. And this is when I started kind of my wheeling and dealing phases. And, and, and this actually led me to the infomercial business, which we can talk about. Yeah. But I mean, that's it was a very exciting big aha moment for you is yeah. the, the infomercial, but, but, you know, go ahead and show the story. Cause it starts with some bars on a TV and, yeah. and seeing that, wait a second, there's an opportunity, but really you're at a trade show. So start there. So, 
So you got to put yourself back in the, this is 1984 now, so I'm dating myself a little bit here, but um, TV, when I first got cable television, I, before that, I, re, I remember black and white TV, right? So and then we got color TV, and then they said, cable's coming. I said, what's cable? And they said, well, it's going to be 30 channels. I only had five. ABC, CBS, NBC, Fox, and one independent, uh, uh, one uh, uh, public broadcasting. So all of a sudden, they're like, well, you're going to have 24 hours of movies, HBO, 24 hours of news, CNN, 24 hours of music, MTV, 24 hours of National Geographic type shows, Discovery Channel. And so, and 24 hours of sports, ESPN. I'm like, wow, this is unbelievable, 30 channels. So I get, I turn on all, the guy installs the cable. I turn, I go through one channel, one, one, one. I get to channel 30, it was Discovery. And it was, it was, it was there was bars on the screen. And I'm like, I call up the cable company. I'm like, wait, wait a minute. I, I, I bought the 30 channel package. I get 29 channels. And on channel 30, there's bars up right now. Check it out. And they said, oh, yeah, well, that's only an 18-hour-a-day network. We deliver to you what Discovery delivers to us. The cable company doesn't produce anything. They're just the distribution of the, the other channels. So I said, you mean for the rest of my time that I'm paying for 30, I'm going to only get 18 hours a day on Discovery? And that's when the aha moment hit. I'm going to put something on that time that will generate revenue for me and for the station because why don't they want to generate some revenue on that six hours? So that's when I started putting products up. And it's sort of a funny story because I used to go to all these trade shows and I met a guy at the trade show, the Philadelphia Home Show at the time, and he was selling a knife set. And, it, it, and I watched him demo this knife and it was so, it was such a great, it was the Ginsu knife and he's cutting through cans and mufflers and sneakers. And, and so I said, let's turn the camera on, capture that pitch and put it on Discovery Channel local in Cincinnati which we did, and then I said, well, let me go to the National Discovery, and I went to National Discovery, and I got a six-hour-a-day block on Discovery nationwide because I started putting more and more products up. So we were putting up um, knife sets and fitness products with Tony Little and juicers with Jack LaLanne, and all of a sudden, I had 100 infomercials, and that, that was the beginning of the and business. not just so here in the States, but all around the world. We found out that if there's bars on the screen in the U.S., they, see, what happened was Discovery was an, only an 18-hour-a-day network because they didn't have enough budget to produce 24 hours a day. In fact, in the 18 hours, they ran the shows a, a couple times already, and they just said, look, why continue to run them over and over and over? In hindsight, they probably should have just kept running them for 24 hours, but they just decided to only program 18 hours. They thought it was a little too much. So there was other channels that were it turned out to only be 18-hour networks that launched after that. But when we went to England, when we went to Germany, when we went to Saudi Arabia, when we went to Latin America, there was 18-hour networks in other countries. So we started doing, we would dub the Ginsu guy, Arnold Morris, we dub him in Spanish, German, Dutch, Italian, French, Swedish, Arabic. We were running in 100 countries, dozens of languages. Pretty amazing. And what's the tally on that? Well, 500 million? Yeah, yeah the, 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 the Ginsu <laughs> knife ended up, and it was various iterations, but it ended up over $500 million in Incredible. sales over the lifetime. Yeah, it was just a, a huge, huge success. So you have a, you write a book, Act Now, and all of a sudden you're starting to be kind of everywhere, a personal brand, and then you get this phone call about coming on this show called Shark Tank, yeah. which you were a little leery of at first because you know, there's no big name out there yet. But Nobody we talk about was, Mark yeah. Burnett and getting the call for Shark Tank. Yeah, yeah. So it was very, it was, it was, first I thought, I think my friends are spoofing me because they're like, this is Mark Burnett and I'm, you know, I'm a TV producer. I said, wait a minute, I know you, you do the, the Apprentice and you do the, you know, he's now got The Voice and he's got, you know, uh, Survivor and all these shows. I'm like, Mark, is this really you, Mark Burnett? And he absolutely says, I'm doing a new show called Shark Tank. Can you come see me? And I'm like, Mark, I said, you know. I, I've seen the Survivor Island show. I know what you put those people through on the island. You, what are you going to put me through on Shark Tank? I said, I don't know. <laughs> are you if, feeding me said, to What are you going to be doing here? My <laughs> wife's like, don't do that show, you know? So she, he said, Kevin, it's a business show. And I'm like, 
but how is Shark Tank a business show, Mr. Burnett? And he said, you got to come to L.A. I promise you, you're going to take pitches and you're going to either. It's the business shark. It's not real sharks. Right. In the in the water. So um, as it turned out, that was what it was. They take pitches. And, 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 and I was a product guy. So he loved having me as one of the original sharks. So so I, I, I shot 175 segments for Shark Tank, which there's five segments to one hour. So I shot 35 one hour shows, which run now all over the world, by the way, because Shark Tank is now in in over 40 countries around the world. And now they, they, they like in India, it just launched in English, dubbed, subtitled, rather subtitled in Hindi. And so so they have that is the primer. But now they're doing an Indian shark tank with wow. Indian uh, and sharks. And in Brazil, they ran the American show. Now they're running. Now they do a Brazilian a Portuguese version of Shark Tank with with Brazilian sharks. And so I'm going to Brazil in in January to do a tour across Brazil as the American shark coming to network with the Portuguese sharks. And I'm doing the same thing in India, too. So I go around the world and Shanghai and, you know, because Shark Tank runs around the world now. It's a really cool um, it's the biggest um, reality business show in the world and um, just an exciting uh, 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 number of years for me to be involved with with that brand. But now I'm in all the reruns. So, you know, you can't get rid of me on, on TV. <laughs> You're so that's a good thing, right? Well, so talk about some because you've had some some fun ones. And I know you talk about some that you, you missed the opportunity. But give us maybe one or two favorite moments from Shark Tank. So Shark Tank was 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 so much fun. Um, one one guy came out. His name was Cactus Jack, and he had a big belly on him, and he's got a fitness product. And we're all looking at each other. And the barber says, "Cactus, you know how could we invest in a fitness product with that big belly you've got?" And so I said, "Barber, I tell you what, let you and I do this deal, and 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 there's one condition." Um, and, and it's, he's got to lose 30 pounds. Okay. So, I mean, no one's ever done that before. I mean, like, you know, it's, it's almost it got a little offensive there, but cactus like, Hey, how long do I have to lose? So we're going to give you 60 days. He did it in 45 days. So that was a, and you know what he was doing? He, he got a, an updated segment because they had to show that Smart. cactus was, <laughs> he's on the scale. We, fi- we filmed to him, get on the scale that day. And then we filmed him 32 pounds lighter. Um, 45 days later, and that was the updated segment. It was a, a, a push-up machine, and Barbara and I did that one. So that was a great time. I did another product called City Kitty, um, and City Kitty was a cat toilet training product, which was crazy. Um, they used in uh, the Meet the Fockers movie with Robert De Niro, and the cat jumps on the toilet, goes to the bathroom. That was really funny. This is a product that I did. If you can see this, this is a, a, a piece of jewelry, and this is Aldo Orta jewelry. He's a Spanish guy. Aldo is an amazing gentleman that's a designer, and he designs, this was designed for Prince Albert of Monaco. And so um, he does women's and men's jewelry. So he said, I, I do $40,000 one-of-a-kind pieces, but now... I've got interest in going mass market, but I need the money to buy the raw materials, the stones, the metals, the the gold, the silver. So um, we put him on QVC, and overnight we had a multi-million dollar business with Aldo uh, Orta. So, um, you know, it, across the board, we have one now called Drain Strain. It's a, 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 a thing that goes in your drain on the in the bathtub or in the sink, and it collects and catches any diamonds that might get, get dropped through the drain. And you're washing your hands, and women do this a lot. They, the soapy, you know, slippery hands, and all of a sudden the diamond ring, uh-oh, it's gone. But this catches all hair and all the different things that are out there. So, so over the years, we've done lots of cool things with Shark Tank and had a, a lot of fun with some, some big, uh, big successes. And, um, and, and I love watching even some of the new stuff that comes out because there's even more viewers today than there, there, there was in, in, in the earlier days, and it's kind of built as a, as a, as a building asset. So it's been pretty exciting. Well, you talk in the first days where it's like, wait a second, we're putting up our own money, and yet you're, you're still shopping the show. So in other words, you don't even know if the show's going to air, well, and yet you're putting your own money. Yeah. And you're like, wait a second, this is serious we're, stuff. This we're is in, my we're money. We're investing real cash, <laughs> and there is no – I mean, yeah, we filmed it, but there's no distribution. I'm like – 
wait a minute, I just had to invest real cash in these deals. Where's this going to air? Well, maybe nowhere. You know, so we were, we were the pioneers. I mean, we took the chances and, and I invested, uh, you know, literally tons of, tons of money, millions of dollars in, in deals that we did that was just unbelievable. So it, it was a lot of fun though, but it's, you know what, it's all, this is what America's all about. This is why I love now to do like we did here in Memphis. We went to the University of Memphis and hung out with some entrepreneurs and had a great evening there. Just went to the City Current uh, Breakfast Club. And well, that was, you know, the uh, I think they call it a signature breakfast. We just had, that was a great time. Hundreds, 400 some entrepreneurial types from all over the world, actually. I think you had some yeah, flew in from Dubai, Dubai right? right? So. Um, so it's, this is what I love to do now. I, I do a hundred events a year. I travel the world and I get to go to, you know, literally about 30 trade shows a year from the houseware show to the hardware show, to the beauty shows, to the fishing shows, the golf shows. I love golf, right? So, um, so it's, it, it's great to be able to get out there and network with all the entrepreneurs. And I also do mentoring and coaching and, um, you know, I give back. So, I'm on several boards. I'm on um, uh, the board of Uni Uni University of Tampa. And it's my way, and I just spoke at the Collegiate Entrepreneurs Organization, a thousand collegiate entrepreneurs. So I give back to uh, the community, to, to the entrepreneurial community. And it's, it's my way of, of, of sharing some of my success with those that are looking to build their business from scratch. Talk about, because even, you know, this morning and last night, you shared a ton of great tips on um, basically surrounding yourself with a team of experts, you know, knowing your team, having great diversity. You can even rent them before you buy them type. I mean, you have a lot of great tips for entrepreneurs. Yeah. Give us one or two of your favorites. So, I mean, one of my favorite um, things, because... As, as a young entrepreneur, I didn't have like millions of dollars in capital to go launch these businesses, right? So I had a, a business that I was launching and I needed capital and I didn't have anyone that knew how to raise capital. I didn't. The banks, I got turned down by five banks. So I met a, a bank, a former bank president and he said, Kevin, he said, let me hear your pitch. And I gave it to him. He says, great. He said, you thought that was good, right? I said, yeah, I thought it was great. He says it was terrible. Okay. So he's like, I'm going to coach you on how to go get financing with the bank. He says, first of all, you got to surround yourself with some experts. You're a young entrepreneur. You're in your 20s. They're looking at you thinking you're going to be out of business next year. You need a good lawyer that's that's got some ba solid background that's going to protect the legal side of your documents and your legal structure. Are you a, a sole proprietorship? Don't want to do that. You got to have a corporation. Should you be an LLC? What's the best legal structure? Then you, you need a good finance guy, someone that has got years of experience in, in fast growth and things that you're going to be doing so so and then when it was all said and done he said and you know what I like what you're doing I'm gonna join your company if there's a place for me and I structured his compensation to happen after we raised the capital so so that's one of the techniques I like to do is bring you know it's sort of like okay look I'll, I'll hire you but I can't pay you now, but once we get the capital, then you're going to get paid, and then maybe it'll be even retroactive, so you got a little lump sum when we get that capital in. So, so that's one of the things I say is rent these experts until you get the money. So I did that with a beauty company also where I, I brought in some experts that were beauty people that used to work for L'Oreal, and we brought in the former CEO, the former CFO, and this was a, a beauty business, and, and they became experts in the company. We raised capital and then they got their compensation. So, you know, you need a dream team because the entrepreneur can't always do it himself. Um, you, you know, and that's one of the big mistakes a lot of entrepreneurs make. Uh, and I, the people will say to me, do you bet on the jockey? And I, I want to see that there's a good jockey, but I want to see that there's a good trainer and, and, and a good doctor and a good dream team around that jockey also because if you bet on just the jockey, you may not win that race. Talk about test before you invest. Okay, that is my new mantra. And in the old days, we would someone would come in, we looked at the idea, yeah, let's do it. And it was really just kind of me and a couple people, key people in the company. And we would throw 50 grand, 100 grand, sometimes 250. We would invest as much as a, a half a million dollars into a project based on, you know, a little bit of due diligence and gut, all right? but. 
we would find out sometimes that it was miserable um, in terms of the opportunity, or it didn't just fail, but it would it would just be terrible. Like, you know, it's one thing to put something out and find out that it came close to making money, you know, but it never could get the break even even. So, okay, you got to walk from that one. But when you put something out where it's like, did the phones, did we even get any phone calls? Like, you know what, it was crickets, you know, when, when we put that up, right? We're like, is the phone center working? You know, but because we were so far off base. So what we do now, in the old days, we had to do all this TV stuff, manufacture the product and everything. Now we test before we invest. And Jeremy, you're right on target here because we have this process where we go on the internet and we can, first, we have two different things we do. One is we can go on Facebook and, and test into a, a, a test market and see if there's people that want this product. So for example, here's an item that we're doing right now that is an eyeglass cleaner. And so it, you, you first get the boulders off because you don't take a, 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 a cloth and clean glasses because there might be dust on there that can scratch them. So get the boulders off. And then this is a carbon cleaning system that just like this, you can see it goes on both sides of the glasses and cleans simultaneously the glasses. And by the way, there's one for computer and there's one for phone screen, et cetera. This is carbon in here. And this is automatically recharged inside when it goes into the charging ion charging station, goes in, and when it comes back out, it's clean and ready to go again. So we tested this to an eyeglass marketplace on Facebook. And the results were amazing. So, um, so this is called Peeps, and in, from zero to 1.5 million dollars a month in sales in the last 60 to 90 days. And this is what I love about meeting with entrepreneurs, meeting with people. Who knows? Somebody out there listening right now may have a product that they want to talk to me about, and that's what I do. I take products and build them big business. I take little products and make them big products. Well, absolutely incredible. I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. Absolutely. Uh, I'm blown away in the fact that you can take that simple idea and turn it into millions of dollars worth of products. So thank you very much for coming to Memphis, for sharing your story and being on a conversation with Kevin Harrington. Good to be here. Thanks, Jeremy. Absolutely. Absolutely.